This episode is brought to you by VPP Simplified. Now you can get element by element tracking and guidance for your VPP journey. Every aspect of the VPP requirements in one easy to use interactive spreadsheet. It explains every sub element in detail, contains an easy to read stoplight so you can track current status for each sub element. It provides you with a three-step verification for completion of each sub-element. There's even a notes section for you to compile language that will eventually be used for your VPP application. It even comes complete with graphs to show current state and track your progress moving forward. Look, achieving VPP star status can be tough, but understanding what it takes to get there can be simplified. This VPP gap tool will help you do that. Go to vppsimplified.com for more information. Welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast, where we help you manage workplace safety one episode at a time. And now, your very own safety pro, Blaine J. Hoffman. Welcome to another episode of the Safety Pro Podcast. In this episode, I want to talk about lean manufacturing principles and how they can help you transform safety in your organization. Now, if you listen to this podcast regularly, and of course I hope you do, you probably have heard me tell you that go look at what tools the lean and quality folks are using in your organization because chances are they've already solved some problems similar to what you're trying to do, or they're using tools that can help you solve a problem that you have, and you want to go and steal from them. There's a good reason why I tell people that, because they can help you improve safety processes. Now, in this episode, I'm going to reference two good books that I've studied in the past, and I will draw upon their lessons throughout this episode. One is called Lean Safety. Transforming Your Safety Program with Lean Management by Robert B. Haffey. The other book is called Safety Performance in a Lean Environment, A Guide to Building Safety into a Process by Paul F. English. In a nutshell, lean is a manufacturing philosophy that reduces the total cycle time between taking a customer order and the shipment, and it's done so by predominantly eliminating waste. So eliminating waste in a process is the focus. So you could see clearly up front that if we were to use this sort of philosophy, apply this approach to safety, we say, look, an accident, if if you want to say air quotes here, accident is a waste in the process. It stops work. It causes us to lose, you know, precious resources. That is our workers. And, you know, we can manage that out of the process, that waste, right? We can eliminate that. And that's sort of the focus. If we kind of just shift our mind a little around, you know, what is an accident truly to an organization, you know, to the business, to the work group, to the cell leader, to the plant manager, and to the employee, it is is something that we didn't want. And even if you look at definitions of an accident, an unplanned accident, unscheduled event. That's the textbook definition that we always read is an unplanned event that interrupts work, causes injury, illness, or property damage. Of course, a near miss is the same thing, except it doesn't result in property damage, injury, or illness, but it's still an unplanned, unscheduled event and consumes time, right? It's waste. So we can kind of look to lean manufacturing principles to help us solve these problems. Another thing that's great about lean principles, they, as I just discussed, apply to all business processes, but, you know, especially safety, but lean can be applied to all types of business. It doesn't matter, you know, when you hear lean manufacturing and you say, well, you know, we're a property developer. We do utilities installation. It it applies. Those principles apply to you. So, They're universal, and that's what I want you to remember as you listen to this episode is, you know, start thinking about, well, what does that look like in our organization? How could we adopt some of those tools, those approaches, those principles in our organization if you haven't done so already? Now, I'm going to take you back to Edward Deming. 
I think he was born in like 1900. I mean, the guy grew up in an, um, in an amazing time in our country, in the world. Uh, he was well-traveled. And he, after World War II, he actually, he was a statistician. And after World War II, he, he traveled to Japan to teach Japanese business leaders how to improve the quality of their processes in, in their work, their businesses. And his work predominantly went unnoticed in the United States until the early 1980s. And what do most of us know or remember about the early 80s? That is, of course, when Japanese auto manufacturers overtook U.S. auto manufacturers in quality and production. That got the attention, finally, of U.S. automotive uh, manufacturing and you know, industrial plants, right? Ford, I think, was the first one to reach out to Deming. So, yeah, Ford first brought Deming in to help them improve their quality systems. What was shocking, though, at the time is when Deming determined that, you know, Ford's quality systems were not the problem. It was their management practices. So a major cultural change would be needed if Ford were to go through this transformation as a business that they needed to stay competitive. So, you know, Deming's work led to the Toyota Production System or TPS that everybody talks about now. The book, The Toyota Way, is very popular. But what he developed during that work, he developed all sorts of, you know, knowledge tools and principles and approaches that companies use today. But I want to talk about what he developed known as the 14 points of management. And we're going to go through them and see how they could possibly relate to safety and talk a little bit about them and then share a couple of stories about how lean principles were used for safety. But first, I want to take a quick break and talk about the official floor marking floor tape company of the Safety Pro Podcast. That's right, I'm talking about Mighty Line Floor Tape. They know how important safety is to your organization. And you can tell, just look at the breadth of their product line. It covers everything you need to implement a 5S system for the increased productivity of your facility and the safety of your workers. Here I want to mention Mighty Line Floor Signs. They're a great product to regulate workplace traffic. They're customizable to fit exactly what your company needs. You can even use your own high-res logos. They are built to last, and for good reasons. One, their patented technology makes it more durable than other floor signs and tapes. Mainly, l- listen to this one, their floor tape is seven times thicker than other floor tapes. The beveled edge increases durability during forklift traffic, and the peel-and-stick adhesive removes easily. Best of all, it's made right here in the USA. Grab a free sample of Mighty Line Floor Tape. Go to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast, fill out the form, get a free sample. While you're there, check out past episodes of the Safety Pro Podcast. Again, MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. Okay, let's get back to Deming's 14 points of management and talk a little bit about how they may apply to safety. Number one, create constancy of purpose towards improvement of product and service with the aim to become competitive and to stay in business and provide jobs. That is what he meant. Clearly, we can see that improving safety processes, reducing injuries, illnesses, environmental releases, incidents like that, it's going to allow us to stay competitive. We're going to be able to hold on to people. They're going to want to work at this business. We're not going to have that turnover, which we know impacts productivity and quality. Every time we have to turn somebody over, train somebody new before they can get up and running and develop the acumen they need to perform the tasks we require, you know, that right there is a loss. It's a loss in productivity and efficiency. So clearly we could see in just number one, right out of the gate, to stay competitive, stay in business and to provide jobs, safety is a major component. Number two, adopt the new philosophy. And what he wrote at the time is, we are in a new economic age. Western management must awaken to the challenge, learn their responsibilities, and take on leadership for change. So adopt the new philosophy, this new way of thinking about, you know, in this case, we're talking about lean manufacturing. But remember, apply it to safety is, you know, do we blame the worker? Do we just, you know, do 
band-aid fixes for problems and continue on like nothing else happened? Or do we look at things from a systemic point of view? We'll get into some of those here as we go down this list. Number three, cease dependence on inspection to achieve quality. Eliminate the need for inspection on a mass basis by building quality into the product in the first place. Safety is no different. If we build safety into our processes from the get-go, we reduce the need to have to have all this administrative oversight of our processes because they're in large part out of control. We don't have to rely on those things as much. So there are some regulatory requirements for inspections. Yes, I get that. But you see the point here in this in this third one is that we can reduce the dependence or the need for that by designing safety from the start. So engineered solutions, replacing materials that are le- with ones that are less harmful, all those examples that we all know about and heard about, this is an example of what we're talking about from number three. Number four, end the practice of awarding business on the basis of a price tag. Instead, minimize the total cost. Move toward a single supplier for any one item on a long-term relationship of loyalty and trust. Here we're talking about reducing the need to have a bunch of purchasers and buyers in the organization and always hunting and shopping around for the best price. That introduces variance in your product quality, your raw material that then the operators have to deal with. What do we know that that can lead to? That can lead to upsets, interruptions, stops in work. How do we uh, approach this with safety? Well, let's talk about personal protective equipment is, you know, once you have got your set of different safety glasses, goggles, face shields, and, you know, you kind of lock that down and you set up a long-term relationship with a supplier, you don't have to worry about shopping around for this stuff. You can actually ensure that they're going to have a certain amount of stock in place that you can draw from so that your workers don't have to wait for items before they can begin certain types of work things like that. So we can kind of take that same approach from the manufacturing sourcing supply chain uh, model and we can look at safety and how we manage it on that end as well. Number five, improve constantly and forever the system of production and service to improve quality and productivity and thus constantly decrease costs. Speaks for itself. Safety is a part of that. It's a part of that process. When we improve the assembly line, we have engineered solutions and we reduce the number of times a human has to interact with the material or the process through automation. And yes, I'm going to use the R word, robots or semi-automation, things like that. I mean, we're still going to need workers, right? We're still going to need employees, but we reduce the risk to these employees when we look at sort of that approach. So the thing that stands out for number five is improve constantly and forever your systems. Continuous improvement. It never ends. You're always looking at it, trying to break it and figure out where we can strengthen it even further. Number six, institute training on the job. Obviously, doing a new hire orientation is needed. You get them used to some of our policies, procedures, filling out some paperwork, things like that. But the more training we can do on the job where they get to see processes, they get to work with a mentor, or have a buddy approach, a buddy system, an OJT process, not just an OJT approach, but an actual process, that's going to be better, right? They're going to understand better what's expected of them on the job. Quality and productivity go up. Safety will as well. Number seven, institute leadership. The aim of supervision should be to help people, machines, and, you know, gadgets do a better job. Supervision of management is in need of an overhaul as well as supervision of production workers. Think about this. When we move from management overseeing things, especially people, to leaders, managers, coaching, supporting them in what they need to do, you shift. Everything shifts. The whole mindset, the whole atmosphere, the climate, the culture shifts a little. You know, the operator is there producing, I'm there to support them. And anything I can do to eliminate the interruptions, the waste, improve their proficiency, their acumen, that's what my role becomes then. It's a change in in mindset that we have to adopt. 
which gets us to number eight, drive out fear. We need this so that everyone may work effectively for the company. Drive out fear. Everyone should be able to raise a hand and say, hey, I need to stop this work because of this reason. I noticed this quality issue. I noticed this machine's doing that. Same thing for safety. We need to empower them. We Not just lip service, actually empower them to say, I can issue a stop work if something isn't safe. We need to support that. So drive out fear. We need to have policies, procedures, and our processes around supporting that, not introducing fear. And I've got a story about that here later in the episode. Number nine, break down barriers between departments. We call them silos, stovepipes, right? We talk about it a lot, but how many people are, how many organizations, I should say, are really successful at doing this? A handful. People in research, engineering, design, sales, production, they have to work as a team. If sales is hearing feedback from the customer about delays in shipments, and that's why they're shopping for other suppliers, they need to be able to bring that to the production managers and supervisors and say, hey, what can we do together to work on this? Here's what they're saying their needs are. You know, it's making us hard to go out and sell. What can we do to help fix that? They should work together. They shouldn't just pass that along and wash their hands of it. Sales team needs to be intimately familiar with the production process and understand the engineering requirements, the quality requirements, the shipping and DOT requirements, whether it's hazmat related or, you know, having a third party carrier. They, if they understand this process better, maybe they can help come up with possible solutions, identify opportunities to improve. But at worst, they're going to be intimately familiar with how we make our product and get it out the door to the customer and can help educate the customer a little bit on, you know, why things are taking as long as they are, not coming up with excuses for the company, but a true understanding of everybody involved from the operator to the managers to the sales team and and the customer. So it helps drive engagement and collaboration. Number 10, a good one, eliminate slogans, exhortations, and targets for the workforce asking for zero defects and new levels of productivity. These, you know, and the reason Deming says this is they only create adversarial relationships because, you know, the bulk of the causes of low quality and low productivity, they belong to the system beyond the power of the workforce. It isn't with the person, it's with the processes we have. So what we're doing is we're saying, we want you to work with the same crappy processes, but we're going to put new benchmarks in place for you and tie bonuses, pay benefits to it and make you try to work, find workarounds to crappy systems and processes. We know what that means for safety, right? They're going to cut corners. Guards are going to be missing. They're going to reach into parts of the machines to grab samples because they can't slow it down or stop it to grab the sample. They're, you know, all that stuff is going to come into play when we have you know, these slogans, exhortations, and un- unachievable targets that we place on them, you know, safety can, can heed a lesson here with number 10 as well. And again, kind of with number 10, number 11, eliminate work standards or quotas on the factory floor, substitute leadership, eliminate management by objective, eliminate management by numbers, numerical goals, and substitute leadership. So Deming is saying, the only way to achieve the goals that we say we want is through leadership. And through leadership, we can drive process improvements, continuous improvement, which will then get us to that goal. So yeah, focus on the end in mind. What's, what is it that we're ultimately after? And we do this in safety, right? We're after zero accidents. And we listen to the past episodes about how to set smart goals and objectives. Start with the end in mind. Nothing wrong with that. We want zero accidents. We can't put that on the wall and say, there you go. Still work with the crappy systems that we have and processes and equipment, but don't get injured. What we want to do is we want to say what leadership needs to happen in order to for us to facilitate zero accidents. That's the shift. We have to focus that shift to the things that we need to do every day continuously that will get us there. Number 12, remove barriers that rob the hourly worker of their right to pride of workmanship. The responsibility of supervisors has to change from just numbers to quality. 
is what Deming is saying, right? And safety is no different. Remove barriers that rob people in management and in engineering of their right to pride of workmanship. This means abolishment of the annual or merit rating and of management by objective. This is the focus for safety. It goes back to what I said just a minute ago, zero accidents, right? So if we're saying, if we're not saying zero accidents, we're saying, you know, empower the employee, raise your hand, stop work if needed. We want you involved. And, but yet managers and supervisors still have this balanced scorecard of, did you have a recordable last quarter? And their bonus is tied to that. They're, so we need to do the same for management as well. What we say to employees about engagement and focusing on the processes and improvements in accident investigations and not you know the discipline, but yet we still look at coaches and managers with that number, then that's a problem. So we need to look at that as well. Number 13, institute a vigorous program of education and self-improvement. This is a no-brainer for safety. Okay, continuous improvement, training and development. We need to continue doing that for our employees, not just when they come in the door, do the initial orientation and boom, that's it. And I'm not talking about the, you know, OSHA requires an annual refresher on this topic or that topic. I mean, true professional development for our staff, for our employees, managers, supervisors, admin, uh, engineers, even, you know, shop floor workers, everybody. We should have a vigorous approach to continued learning. And number 14, put everybody in the company to work to accomplish the transformation. The transformation is everybody's job. So if Deming's context here is quality, we're looking at safety. It's everybody's job. It isn't the operator who says, eh, my machine's got a problem with it. I'm done. I, I can't. It's, I, I told somebody I did my job. No. Grab maintenance. Grab an engineer, grab the safety rep, the safety manager, your supervisor, say, hey, you know, when do you notice this happening? How often does this happen? It only seems to happen when I run this part. Maybe what we can do, be a part of the process, okay? Don't just wash your hands of it and step away. Now I'm, I can collectively sense the eye rolls as you listen because we have union shops, we have non-union shops. I don't want to get into any of that. I'm just going to talk about people. If we can get people involved, you're going to be in a better position. Nope, you're not going to net everybody. I follow the 10-80-10 rule. It's not failed me yet. 10% of your population is going to do the right thing. Doesn't matter who says it, how you say it, or where it's posted. They're going to do the right thing because they understand that's the right thing to do. Follow the rules. 80% of us, we do the right thing. We just need reminders every once in a while. We need people to come around and, and, and talk about it in meetings and and we'd like to see other people doing it and, and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, we're supposed to be doing this. Then you got the bottom 10%. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who says it. Doesn't matter uh, who's saying it, how they're saying it. It's their rules were meant to be broken. And we're going to have that. Okay. I'm talking about the top 90% of folks. Union, non-union, doesn't matter. Uh, I've been in both shops over the years. And I can tell you right now, it, it's that bottom 10%, I don't even engage. OK, other than to say, you know, you're are you doing your job? Yes or no. But, you know, beyond that, no, it's that 90 percent of the others that you're going to get involved. OK, so think of it that way. Turn that around. Don't focus on that bottom 10 percent or less that's going to screw everything up for you. Right. Don't let that squeaky wheel be the justification for doing nothing for 90 percent of your employees. They deserve better. So these 14 points are critical to safety, and it's a lean principle. We can rob, we can steal from that and use it for safety as well, especially since the organization has probably already adopted these over there in quality, and they're talking this language. Let's go join them. Let's go join them in that discussion and shift a little bit, pivot that to safety. So I hope that you see how clear, how universal these can be. I want to talk about another tool, another useful tool we can take from, from Lean. And I mean, there's many, right? I've done past episodes on Lean tools, um, the Fishbone Diagram, 5Y. You can get those templates uh, still. If you go check out those episodes, you can download free templates for those. But another one is Demaic. Define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. So 
let's go through what this might look like for safety. So define, again, in safety terms, who is the customer? Most likely it's going to be our employees. You know, what is the voice of the customer? I, something like, I don't know, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get injured. I'm tired of getting splinters and slivers. I'm tired of get lacerations or burns. You know, what's the voice of the customer? What are they telling us? Okay. What is critical to safety regarding what the voice of the customer is saying? And what is the cost of poor safety of doing nothing? And is that acceptable? So define the problem. Measure. Use the cause and effect fishbone, 5Y. Is the safety process, is it in control? You know, what's not working that's leading to this issue, right? How do we measure that? What is the current safety process performance or capability? What actions are being taken to protect the employees or the company? That would be sort of a containment question. What are we doing in the interim to protect uh, people while we continue to measure what is actually happening here? So define, measure, analysis is next, right? Which issues are affecting health and safety the most? How many samples do you need to draw this conclusion? That's the question we ask. You would ask it in quality as well. Then you move to improve. You've defined it. You've been able to measure it. You've analyzed the measurements, the data, and it's telling us a story. We can kind of formulate a, an, an approach or a path forward, right? What is the ideal solution? What is the proof that the solution will work, right? What's our leap of faith assumption? And how do we test that? How many trials are needed to determine whether or not that's effective? What's the work plan to implement and validate those solutions once we determine it's working? And then how do we sustain it? How do we roll that all the way out to the rest of the site as it applies? And that gets us to control, the last letter in the acronym, control. Can you demonstrate the improvement is sustainable over time? Is the process in control? And more importantly, how do we keep it that way? So we've defined it, measured it, we've analyzed it, we've come up with an improvement plan, and it works and we're able to control it. So DMAIC is, is a real quick tool that Lean World, the Lean World, uses that we can steal and use for safety. It's an approach, right? Again, just one example of how Lean principles and tools can be applied to safety. Uh, furthermore, actually, you know, this can empower everyone in an organization to champion safety. So, so wh what this says is safety leadership doesn't require a business leader or a manager. A shop floor worker can get some lean training and begin identifying ways to improve the systems they have and are required to interface with every day. Then that includes safety. We see this in uh, accident investigations as well, right? One of my favorite lines to use on folks is w when it comes to accidents is to focus on the process, not the person. Now, in his book, Lean Safety, Robert Haffey, he tells a story about accidents at a manufacturing that he uh, once toured, right? They uncovered a trend in forklift accidents. So some of the managers at that site, they looked into these force monitors, right? These are devices that will shut the forklift down in the event of an impact that and it would require the operators to go and find a manager or supervisor to turn it back on. So it kind of forces the reporting of, you know, running into something. The reason is most of the accidents were hit and runs, no witnesses. So that's, that was their answer. Well, we'll force the issue and we'll make people report these by killing the forklift when it's involved in an impact. Now, Haffey's approach was a little different. Because they had no idea who caused the damage, I mean, it was usually reported by somebody that found it other than the driver, they needed an approach that removed that aspect from the equation in order to build trust. The approach was to invite a forklift driver, any driver in that area, to help investigate. They were told up front, and, and this is key, they were told up front they would not be spending any time looking for who was responsible, but rather to determine the root cause and come up with corrective processes to put in place in order to prevent recurrence, right? So what they discovered was the majority of the accidents were a direct result of poorly placed uh, racks, improper clearances, some were fire extinguishers hanging on the wrong sides of columns and pull stations that were poorly located, and they were running into this stuff just trying to do their job. So they went about fixing those things. 
And wouldn't you know, soon enough, the drivers that had accidents actually began self-reporting. The reason is trust. The approach to many accident investigations completely destroys trust. It focuses on what did you do wrong instead of how can this be improved. And I remember myself at a client site years ago, uh, an operator got a laceration from removing a glove to grab a sample piece of metal off the line for a quality check, and management wanted to issue discipline for removing PPE. The problem was everyone was issued the same gloves, these heavy leather gloves because of the sharp metal edge of their product, but they were also required to cut a sample piece for a quality check. I mean, they all knew you couldn't pick up this this thin four-inch wide sample of of strip, right, this metal strip with these gloves on, so everyone, every worker removed their glove to do so, and management knew it. They were standing there half the time watching people do it. But those other workers didn't get a laceration, or at least not yet. So issuing discipline would destroy trust, drive reporting underground, and lead to a whole other host of problems. It did nothing to address the root cause. The conditions remained exactly the same, Therefore, they were doomed to repeat themselves. So by focusing on the process, we were able to determine that the form, fit, and function of those gloves, on that line anyway, needed to change. So we got samples in from a couple of different vendors. We brought in for the operators to try. We scored them based on cut resistance level and uh, the dexterity that they offered. So that operator, actually, he became part of the solution, not just another victim and a hazard of the job, right? They actually improved the process of the PPE. They had a variety of which to choose from instead of that one size fits all. And they were able now to pick up those pieces and inspect them per their quality standard safely without worrying about getting a laceration and thus worrying about whether or not they were going to get fired. So the main takeaway I want you to get here is look towards lean principles to help you improve safety, mainly building the trust needed and build a collaborative environment where you turn workers into champions for change and improvement across all areas of the business. So I have links in the show notes for several books on this topic. Uh, You can also go to the safetypropodcast.com slash resources. For my ever-growing reading list, I keep adding books there. I I read a lot. I uh, talk to folks a lot that have tried these things, and uh, I've done a lot of these myself over the over the years. But you know, over over a decade of uh, consulting in many different industries, big and small, and uh, you know, I can tell you right now, there are varying approaches to a lot of this stuff, but they're rooted in similar principles. And lean principles, they're not going to steer you wrong. They aren't. And as a matter of fact. If your organization has already adopted a lean approach to manufacturing, engineering, and and quality, having safety programs sort of follow those lean principles is going to feel natural to them. You're going to integrate well with the organization, with the business. And you know, if you've, again, if you've listened to this podcast, you talk, uh, you've heard me harp about this, right? Get on my soapbox. You know, we, safety professionals, we need to stop thinking we're special. We're not. We are a part of the team. We need to collaborate. We need to integrate well with the other parts of the organization. So we need to stop lamenting and bemoaning the fact that these supervisors and managers don't understand safety and safety words and safety lingo and jargon and stop crying about that and just actually put safety in terms that they can understand. Use language that they use every day. Make it comfortable and easy for them to adopt the safety mindset that we know that they need. And we can do that with lean. We can look at these lean principles, tools, and approaches and actually start, you know, running alongside them instead of up against them, uh, which all too often seems to be um, commonplace in a lot of organizations. So look, let me know what you think. The links are in the show notes to these books. Go to the safetypropodcast.com forward slash resources for more info. Don't forget, visit our friends at MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. Grab your free sample of Mighty Line Floor Tape. Past episodes of the podcast are on there as well. And as always, until the next Safety Pro Podcast episode, please be safe. Be safe.